and we're live all right everybody welcome to raging with we've got a special guest this evening mitch rogers and we're going to be talking about his creative journey we are simulcasting to indie vault comics in morning jersey geek insider as well as rage and avc hit the button share this out with your friends and also take a look at the show descriptions because we have links where you can find mitch's project the boger southern gothic and we will be talking about that and the creative process right after this right. Asian. Howdy, everybody. Make sure that you hit the share button and subscribe to wherever it is that you're tuning in from. I'm going to drop the card here so that we can say hello. Hi, Mitch. Hello. How's it going? Doing well. Doing well. We're going to dive right into this. All right. I want to know about your creative journey. What in the world possessed young Mitch to get into comic books? Well, I've, uh, ever since the first time I ever read Calvin and Hobbes, I've been into comics. Um, what made me want to do comics was probably sounds cliche from a nineties kid was, uh, Todd McFarlane's spawn, you know, mm -hmm. the idea that someone can do it, you know, by himself, although he didn't do it by himself for long, but you know, just that concept, you know, I was like, Oh, you know, I can create my own stuff. And, you know, then I started reading more and more of the indie, you know, books, you know, cause I found like Mike Mignola's Hellboy, Sam Keith's The Max, you know, and all that stuff in the nineties. Oh shit! Uh, obviously Ninja Turtles also, I was a huge Ninja Turtles fan. And then when I you know, found out they were based on a comic book that only two guys did, you know, that really set me off on, on a, on a, a journey of wanting to uh, do my own comics. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I eventually got my first comic out in 2009, um, summer of 2009, uh, after, you know, going to college, dropping out of college, getting a, you know, a day job and then just, you know, you know, saying, you know what, I'll just go ahead and, you know, and start now and doing it and it's been 12, I guess going on 13 years since. Yeah. I, I mean, doing it from, uh, 2009 onward yeah. uh having been on this journey myself I, it's one of the hardest things that i've ever done yeah. and there are yeah. a lot of misconceptions with people who don't who've never studied the industry or aren't part of it they're like oh it's just pictures and words it's cartoons it's it's this and that it's for kids it's really not no so what ha uh, what no, is your, yeah uh, yeah i mean do you want do you have opinions on that like what would you say well, to some of those people well, um, I, I, um, I got out of the kid stuff pretty quick, you know, it was about middle school and stuff. I started watching, you know, the, the, you know, the, you know, the big movies like Godfather, um, mm -hmm. Scarface. I had an uncle who was a film buff, you know, and that's what you know, got me into like the more non, uh, kid stuff. And, you know, and for comics, I, I was into superheroes you know, growing up in the kid stuff, but mostly I was into the more, um, mature stuff, you know, not necessarily like, you know, quote unquote porn comics. Cause people mm -hmm. always bring that up when I, you know, talk about, you know, normies, not comic book people. Yeah. You know, but, you know the normies out there like, Oh, Oh, you read, you know, you know, the naughty, no, you know, it was more like Neil Gaiman, Sandman. Oh my God. Uh, you know, the guy. vertigo stuff in high school, I discovered, the underground stuff, which yes. really 
you know, hit me on, um, oh, it's really, uh, got me excited because it wasn't just, you know, typical, you know, guy or, you know, guy or girl, you know, you know, finding a bad guy or whatever, you know, they were character driven. There were usually multiple storylines going on at the same time, mm -hmm. which I've always found interesting. I've always loved great storytelling along with art. Um, you know, and, and when people ask, ask me, you know, like, um, you know, like, I would get into comics, but I'm just not into superheroes. You know, so if I always ask them, what's your favorite genre of film or, or novel, you know, cause mm -hmm. there's going to be at least five titles that were done that are great in that subgenre, uh, genre or subgenre. You know, right. It was making comics. You know, you always, I mean, if you're not talking to a fellow comic book fan or creator, you always get, you know, oh, what's your superhero's name? Uh -huh. What are his powers? You know, you know, you know, what are his villains like? What's his secret identity? And I'm always like, I don't do superheroes. You know, I'm a horror guy. Mm -hmm. My yes. main character and everything's a monster. You know, like, oh, I wouldn't let my kids read that. I'm like, I hope you don't. I didn't Sorry. write it for your children. You know, it, Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean... You can, but, that, but, but that's I the thing. You know, people people see comic books and they're like, "Oh, it's for kids." It's like, mm, yeah. no, no. There is so much more that it's out there. I mean, the all ages I understand is very. It, it's yeah. it's a hard sell. Uh, for any for any genre, yeah. uh, for any um, I would say publishing endeavor that you're doing too. You know, ch children's books, very competitive, um, but. Uh, with comic books too it's like there's a lot more that's for your middle grade and adult and uh really a lot more like you were saying the underground yeah. stuff you know where there's just it's uh some of it, a, a lot of it's not safe for work definitely yeah. for adults you know and then you have to as a parent really uh there are some that walk a fine line between like okay maybe my teenager isn't really old enough for this kind of content but certainly it's not all superheroes yeah. you know yeah and and i kind of find it funny that a lot of the people that you know nowadays um you know, seem to, you know, say like, oh, comics are just superheroes or kid stuff and nothing else, seem to read manga, mm -hmm. which is basically comic books, you know, essentially they're words and pictures told in sequence that tell a story. And there's science fiction, there's horror thriller, there's romance, you know, there's all the genres that are in American comics. It's just for some reason, American comics are stereotyped uh as just for kids you know this one genre in um same with european comics um you know when i was a teenager i discovered heavy metal magazine and got into nice. richard corbin and mobius and i can never pronounce his name right i'm i'm probably going to butcher it philippe julier you know the guy that draws you know on the huge huge pieces of paper um uh who else von bonet you know of course you know, the standards, Chrome, Spiegelman, and all that. But mm -hmm. but in the 90s, reading comics, in, in the underground scene specifically, um, you know, you had, like, Daniel Klaus and um, Peter Bagg, you know, that kind of took the underground aesthetic but brought it into the 90s and beyond because, you know, those guys are still doing books, obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sorry, but I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. No, I, I love hearing about the influences and stuff like that, because that certainly having gone through your campaign, certainly uh, a reflection of the type of stories that you're, that you do. So tell me a little bit about your writing process then. Have, have you started off with prose and kind of worked into comic book scripts um, or what was your process in that sense? Uh, it was actually uh, the other way around. I started doing comics um, even even before I broke in. Um, I was always doing comics, you know, since you know being a kid, and then I got in, uh, got into doing prose like in high school. 
uh, you know, primarily just because, you know, there were some stories that I had in my head that I couldn't tell visually. Uh, or I didn't think would work visually that would work in a pro setting more, uh, more. but I do start with, um, with like an outline when I'm writing my stories, you know, you know, this chapter, this happens, this happens. Then I actually write it out. Um, it's easier for me as a prose type story. Then I convert that into, you know, page one, panel one and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I do a lot of, uh, planning, uh, at least I try to, uh, you know, because I'm one of those guys that has to have everything down pat in, um, in, uh, everything in my head on paper before I move to the next step, you know, which mm -hmm. is the, you know, the illustrating and inking and all that. One of the uh, one of the first things uh, when I was uh, kind of stepping into this realm of comic books was approaching people and saying, "Hey, I I have a story. Where do I go from here? You know, like what does a standard script look like?" And everybody had a different answer. <laughs> I mean, there's like there is no standard. So. Um, what was it like for you when you were doing this kind of like in the early two, you know, early two thousands internet's really not as prevalent, probably not as much information no. as, as there is now. Uh, like how did you kind of muddle your way through? Well, I got a lot of knowledge on how to do comics from things like wizard magazine mm -hmm. uh, as kind of controversial you know, modern audiences you have about that. They did have a lot of like instructional articles on like how to write a page, how to, you know, tell a story, you know, in you know, these types of panels work for, uh, for suspense or action over these types. Mm -hmm. um, and also just talking to people, you know, building a network of people that either knew how to do it or wanted to do it, but didn't know how. You know, because you can uh, find um, like knowledge and stuff just by bouncing around ideas. You know, like, oh, this worked for me. Why don't you try it? Or, you know, you know I see this works for you. How can I do it? Type stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that must have been um, like when you're when you go back and think about your earlier works and stuff like that. Are, are there a lot of cringe moments where you're like, Oh my yes. God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I was, I was so ahead of, you know, ahead of my, or, um, I was so full of myself to say that, <laughs> you know, like even when I did my first, um, graphic novel, which was the first Boger story. Yeah. Like I was collecting it into one volume and then, I was just looking back at it. I was like, Oh my God, why did I, you know, why did I do that? You know, why did I have that character say that? And I ended up redoing a lot of it, you know, because I got done over the span of five years. Mm -hmm. And so much has uh, changed from the first issue to the last issue, both storytelling, my art style and so forth that I was just like, I can't have this all in one book. So the early, uh, the first book I ended up doing completely, from or redoing uh, completely from scratch and just you know tweaking some stuff that I just did not like. I had this bizarre style that I thought was good at the time and it wasn't. What was that style was, like? I was, gotta know. It was probably a cross between really uh, very well, it was basically a poor imitation of Stephen not Steven, sorry, Sam Keith meets Ted McKeever, but done very, very poorly. <laughs> um, I could draw better at the time, but for some stupid reason, I thought that was, oh yeah, that looks awesome. And then looking back, I was like, uh, it doesn't look awesome. You know, and even <laughs> now after I got the, you know, what I call the extended version of, of the first, uh, Boger story, I still look back and I'm like, I could have done better in other parts, but you know, the book's already been printed. So yeah. So I'm not going to spend years just redoing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. It's also fun 
uh, uh, for me to see like where uh, some people were at the beginning. Mm-hmm. I mean, where they were later. And I was like, Oh, if something that bad can become something that good, then I can deal with having some of my worst, you know, stuff out there for people to see. I think it's kind of cool too, because people will see the progression in your storytelling, in your art uh, and everything like that. So being that, okay, so you are the artist and the writer for your stories then. Do you think of your stories more with like the artist brain or the writer brain? Uh, It depends on the, part of the process I'm on. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously when I'm writing it out for, excuse me, I, I try to think visually, um, you know, because I'm you know, doing it visually, you know, so I know what to go by. Uh, but then when I'm illustrating it, sometimes I will, you know, the sort of storytelling part of my brain will kind of take over and go, uh, uh, what I have written here might work better if I do it this way. If I put this panel in front of this one instead of behind it, it makes more sense. Uh, I'm one of those people that thinks that there's no part of the creative process that you, uh, or I'm trying to put this in words, sorry. Um, mm-hmm. I'm one of those guys that like I have a hundred thoughts. I'm trying to put them in uh, into verbal stuff. Um, there's no part of the creative process where you shouldn't be creative. In, in my opinion, like you could be done, you know, it's lettered and everything and you're about to send it off to the printer and an idea comes in your head. You know, I think there's just as much reason to do it as if that idea came at the beginning of the process. Mm-hmm. Because if you limit yourself in that way, then your stuff starts to be limited. And then you start messing up and start, uh, telling bad stories or drawing bad panels or mm-hmm. like I well, want people that, you know, be as creative as you can whenever you can. Cause I was going to say with, uh, with both the writer and the artist brain, they, they do function very different differently. It's, it's like that split personality within you. And so because you do it all, does it ever feel like you're, you're battling or, uh, um, with which way to go, how to keep yourself organized, and uh, and maybe because you're doing it all, it might not be as specific on your script. Like if we looked at your script, would it be chicken scratch? Would it be like oh, like you're looking you're looking at it, going, yeah, I don't know what I wrote there. <laughs> um, well, uh, because my writing's so bad, I do have to type it out before I start illustrating it. Cause yeah, I, I have run in, um, into that before I started typing them out and printing them, I would have like something written down and I'm like, what does that say? What is that? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So, you know, like, you know, look at it, turn it upside down. Right. You know, try to, <laughs> what is this chicken scratch? Yeah. I do that <laughs> yeah. all the time. I have notes, post-it notes everywhere. And it's like, what the hell? And I'll even have some that say urgent and I can read urgent, but nothing else. It's like, fuck <laughs> me, man. Yeah. Don't forget this. <laughs> right? like, it's like, oh, uh, yeah. What is that? What does that go to? So um, when, with, when it comes to like your cheating tools and things like that, I know Nita loves her, you know, index cards and things like that. So we have sticky notes like crazy. I've got like so many notebooks and there's like, notes of all the things in all the books. So it's not like one dedicated book. How do you kind of keep yourself organized? Because there are a lot of people who, especially the creatives who are really scattered like that. How do you kind of bring that all in so that you can focus? Well, one trick I've learned is keep um, all your notebooks that go to the same thing together, you know, cause yeah, before I got that down pat, I would, uh, look through notebooks because I'm one of those guys that has to take notes and has to know what I'm going to do before I do it. You know, write the characters, like, you know, who they are, what they are, what they like, because that can add to the story. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, there was times when I was just first starting out where 
you know, I would, you know, look at notes for one book and then I would, you know, pick up, you know, the next notebook and I'm looking and it's something completely different. I can't remember what book that went to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah Here, I, just I learned, to give you an example, I've got the one yeah. notebook and you see, like, I have different sticky notes for different things. And then it's like paper clips and folded oh, notes yeah. and stuff like that. And every once in a while, I just have to go through every single one of them and, and figure out, okay, what, what can go, what can stay, you know, what gets a new sticky. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of insane. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those guys that just, you know, writes it all on paper, you know, on the paper, <laughs> you know, I'll have, you know, like a whole full written page and then, you know, there'll be an arrow going to here and you have to turn the page around and here's you know, like a whole paragraph I want to insert on. It's, it's uh -huh. crazy. I'm, I'm a crazy person. <laughs> Aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> So when uh, when you're putting um, your words together, uh, there are a lot of people. So we recently spoke to somebody and he doesn't throw out a thing, not a word, not a phrase, nothing like that. Um, and then there are other people who are just like, no, nah, that's crap. And, you know, they throw it out and it's it's gone. I know for me personally, um, I love my first draft usually because they can work with it. And then sometimes it just disappears. Something happens, your computer crashes or whatever. And it's like, you it's devastating. It fire, throw it away. Right. So, Don't but wait. sometimes it's, sometimes it's devastating because you're like, I had that phrase just right. And you can never, you can never recreate it again. Not like that, you know? Yeah. So you struggle. Um, how do you overcome things like that when you lose some of your words or some of those ideas? Um, you know, maybe something just kind of blows up and you're like, ah, oh, damn. Have you ever had to start from scratch on something? Uh, fortunately, no, because I have so many notes. <laughs> okay. Like, like, you know, I might have lost one change that I did from, you know, one form of, you know, to another, but I, I keep so many notes that, um, I may forget, you know, where goes, what goes where, but I don't think I've lost much. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never, again, yeah, like, um, usually if, you know, say I lose the computer file, I have the, the last draft that was handwritten that I can just, you know, start, mm -hmm. uh, start a new draft from there and, you know, and just go. It's, and that uh, is the benefit of long yeah. and Meredith. You know how you used to make fun of me for writing in longhand all the time? The very first time I wrote a story without using a notebook, my computer crashed, dude, and I lost like almost 10,000 fucking words. Oh, you hexed yourself. No, you hexed me. You're <laughs> the one who said typing would be faster. <laughs> it's my fault. I take the blame. I got, I got big shoulders. I can take it. I can take it. Um, so when it comes to stories then, Mitch, what does that uh, what does that look like? Is it um, for me personally? Like I've woken up in the middle of the night with dialogue running through my head, just over and over, and I'm like, "All right, I'm up. I'm, I'll write this down." Uh, sometimes it's a title, and I'm like, "Oh, that that's a great title." And just from that, a story will be birthed. So, yeah. what is your storytelling like? Where does that come from, and uh, how does your muse speak to you? Uh, it like where ideas come from or mm -hmm. is that what you're asking whether whether it's ideas yeah. or i mean has it been yeah. just a word a title uh, a it, sentence it can be anything mm -hmm. uh you know there's no um like i said earlier that there's you know i don't think uh there's no spot where you can't be creative there's no spot where ideas can't pop up mm -hmm. but um in and uh, most of my ideas uh, specifically for the Boger stories come from uh, non-horror elements hmm. um, or, or non-horror stuff like uh, Southern Gothic is heavily influenced by, uh, it was kind of a weird combo, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and Andy Griffith. Um that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, All right. We, we want to get into the brain, into your brain for that. Yeah. How in the world did that happen? <laughs> I, you know, it just came uh, to me one day. I think I was either watching the movie or, or watching uh, uh, the movie being To Kill a Mockingbird and, or watching Andy Griffin. I was like, you know what? It would be 
cool for like this type of setting for this to happen. And then that became Southern Gothic. Uh, I have another um, uh, story that I wrote, a prose story that was published in a, in a friend's magazine two years ago, I think, um, uh, called Elizabeth started from, or popped from an argument I had back in college with a friend of mine, you know, it's where the idea kind of stuck. I wrote mm-hmm. some notes, you know, later on found them and developed a story. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I've had story ideas uh, by listening to music, by just driving somewhere, you know, I'll see something on the side of the road, you know, and I'll, I'll um, get an idea from there. I mean, there's no telling. Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> And, and I don't think of many people that I know of personally who are creative that have like this set way of coming up with ideas. Uh, there's the old um, Harlan Ellison joke, he would say, you know, when someone, I would ask him where his ideas can come from, he'd you know, say the joke, uh, Schenectady. You know, like, <laughs> what's that? He goes, us, uh, uh, this idea service in Schenectady, I, you know, send them some money and they send me ideas. And there's always some. Well, he said there's always someone that asks for the address, mm-hmm. but, um, <laughs> but yeah, there's no, yeah, there's no telling, you know, ideas find me it's more true. than I find ideas. People I love that you said of, that, you yeah, know, no, I totally get that. I totally get that. I'm just like, uh, because there are some days where I'm like, where are you? Where are my words? Come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very rarely I'll get an idea if I just sit down with a notepad or a sketchbook, mm-hmm. you know, usually it's, it's somewhere else. I guess it's because the mind's relaxing. Right. Um, yeah. The worst thing yeah. is a blank page for me. That is like yeah. the worst thing. It's like, Oh, now I got to fill it, you know, damn. <laughs> but I think you're right. When we're busy, uh, you know, it's just our imagination goes, our tasks our lists and everything else. And, and we're working through that. And all of a sudden it's just like, Oh, I could probably expand on that. And then now being that you do horror, um, how many of these characters have you written are based on people in your life? Because I know for me, there's like, there's a lot of bloodletting in my head. (laughs) Mary. What? That's sacred, dude. Don't blurt that. (laughs) Like if your friends picked up your book, they'd be like, dude, why do you? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that. Yeah, that I've tried to stay away from because I could see that happening. Like I write a friend and do a book, uh-huh. um, and <laughs> yeah, and you know they're like, "Hey, you, hey, why'd you have this happen to me?" And it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. So I learned that you know even even before I started doing um, uh, comics, like you know publishing and stuff, I learned that fast not to include people you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, because like if you have any like uh when i was in elementary school you know if i decided to base a character on say a bully i had or something that would um probably affect my opinion of them worse mm-hmm. um you know because i know some people that will base you know like bullies or you know a bad teacher they hated they would base a character on and again you could tell that it might have uh, not have started when they started writing it but uh, definitely when they were done with it they really really hated that person you know and i don't like that i don't like if i um, feeling that way i i will base characters on like historical people or just mm-hmm. people that i hear about uh, uh that's easier for me um I guess emotionally, you know, you know, cause I'm not, you know, taking out any rage on anybody or something. Cause, cause you know, some days I have a lot of rage, uh, you know, I, I say it, it's totally walls. therapeutic, totally right. therapeutic. It's like the, the, the bloodletting is like, they just change the names to, to protect the innocent. Yeah. Or well, what about the disclaimer so at the beginning of your books? <laughs> No identification yeah. with actual Not, persons, living or deceased, places, buildings, and products is intended or should be inferred. So there you go. Uh, plausible deniability. Oh Not God. a lot of people read that. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I've no, just because you put a disclaimer on something doesn't mean people will read it. Shh, shh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I, I do. Uh, for for me, it's very therapeutic. You know, it's like, oh, okay, yeah. Now, now you're on my list. Yeah, fuck yeah. you, Travis. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> <for it tonight. laughs> Slayed in the next book. <laughs> um, we are at the 30 minute mark. We're going to take a quick break. Um, let me find your card here. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. This is episode 50 with Mitch Rogers. We're going to be right back after this break. This is the legend of the traveling TARDIS. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Also catch us on the HWWS Web TV YouTube channel. Subscribe today and become part of the legend. All right, everybody, for a 10% discount on your Gemini mailers, make sure that you go over to GeminiComicSupply.com and use coupon code VOLT10, V-O-L-T-1-0. That's right. You can save 10% on your Gemini mailers. Use that coupon code VOLT10. That is courtesy of IndieVolt. Thank you to Varian Grant. We've also got a little bump here. Uh, it is, it's only got maybe a little over two days left on the campaign. That is Build the Bull. We'll be right back after this. All right, and we are back. We are raging with Mitch Rogers. He's got the Boger Southern Gothic right now on Indiegogo. Uh, he's got 45 days left of his campaign with a flexible goal. And uh, if you are tuning in, make sure that you check out the show notes because we've got the links to his social media as well as his Indiegogo link. And uh, some of our sponsors are there as well. So make sure that you... Uh, you use those links, especially that coupon code. Save some money. Hi, Mitch. Hello. So uh, the Boger, you said this is a story that you've been working on for a while now. Uh, well, the character I've been working on for a while. I started mm -hmm. um, Southern Gothic, which is the second like official story in the um, in the loosely connected series back in two thousand. 15 or 16 like i can't remember mm -hmm. uh started off as a four issue mini series and now i'm collecting it into one volume adding some extra story or, or some extra features in it some um you know some extra scenes and stuff to kind of smooth out the story um mm -hmm. yeah well um, so we're, we are going to bring up your campaign in just a minute, but I, I want to ask you about some of these other things that, uh, that I see here, the flesh and blood collection. What is yeah. that? Uh, that's basically, uh, kind of like a collective term for my non boger work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like every once in a while I'll put out like one issue of, uh, of something that will have, you know, like short stories, either prose or comics, uh, you know, it's, eventually when I get enough of them uh, to feel like one volume, I'll put out uh, one trade of it. Um, yeah, and I have, uh, I mean, I have tons of, I, of you know, stories that I've either done or want to do that uh, don't fit within the larger narrative of the Boger series. So, um, so I kind of tongue-in-cheekly came up with, you know, the Flesh and Blood collection. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as a way to kind of market my non-Boger work, like I said. 
Well, sure. I mean, we as creators, it's uh, it's really hard to stay with one idea, one character. I yeah. mean, there are there are some creators where you know we've talked to them and they're like, oh yeah, I've got I've got a hundred books in mind for this, um, you know. And then you know, to what you were saying with this collection, that's that's more my speed. You know, I love writing these little flash fiction pieces and seeing if I can kind of hammer them out into scripts. That That's kind of uh, where I am. And then even it, expanding them into like a single floppy or standalone or maybe even um, eventually collecting them into yeah. into this piece. How far into that are you? And when do you think we might see something from that? I'm um, trying to think. I'm at least half, if not three quarters, uh, done with what could be one volume. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because I kind of do them when I can. Right. Um, obviously, since the Boger is my main thing, I kind of, you know, if I don't, um, if I'm not working on like one storyline, yeah, I'll work on, on the other or, or I'll take time off. I'll do a little bit of of the boger here a little bit of something else there and mm -hmm. um you know, i actually have a magazine like a fanzine type you know that i uh print off from kinkos uh, <laughs> where i uh um as like a way to keep uh material coming out uh, uh called uh midnight theater and that kind of has you know basically both boger and flesh blood collection stuff mm -hmm. uh in it each issue like one there's always like one Boger story and one other story. You know, I'm trying to keep it like that, you know, for the time being, just so I can get, you know, stuff out and, you know, get rid of all the ideas on my head that aren't out yet. Is it easier for you to kind of work solo or have you thought about, you know, kind of taking some of these shorter stories and maybe trying to find an anthology that it would be, that it would find a nice home in? Um, I've, I've thought about that. Uh, when I started out some of my shorter stuff, I did kind of send out, mm -hmm. you know, that was back in 2009. So there wasn't much outlets for that. Um, I may try to, to, a, to, um, to a do it at some point, but I'm kind of such a control freak about my own stuff. And, um, uh, it was kind of hard for me to work with someone you know, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, I understand, you know, if someone has an anthology, you know, and they're putting their, you know, or they're putting stuff in it. Um, but it's, I, I kind of, I guess as my personality, I just, you know, have like a no, uh, uh, what's the word? Like no negotiation. I can't, you know, I can't mm -hmm. strive away from what I want to do you know, right. with my own oh, we stuff. Don't, Nita, we don't know anything about that, do we? Oh, no, we were just rejected, period, for an anthology, because we won't bow. Uh, <laughs> Suck I'm, it. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with people who uh, are willing to change stories or characters to fit, you know, someone else's, like, anthology or someone else's publishing them. It's just, I know what um, I put into every everything and it's kind of hard for me to negotiate that or to yeah um uh, negotiate is probably not the right word um you know i can't um i can't like let this go to keep this you know mm -hmm. or you know or whatnot if you yeah if the words that are coming I, out of my mouth or i got you mitch okay. i got you this is my ball this is my <laughs> playground yeah and yeah. I'll and I'll play what I want to play. Yeah. yeah, sometimes I ramble, so I don't know if I hit the point. Or not. <laughs> no, I I totally get that because uh, it's it's really hard to share that sometimes or or let your baby go yeah. because at the end of the day you want to put out a quality thing. Kind of going solo is is difficult and lonely as that can be sometimes. At least you know that you've made yeah. all the decisions. You know. Yeah. yeah. And one story about that, I uh, mentioned my earlier story, Elizabeth, that my friend published in his uh, magazine. Um, we had a long discussion after it was published because he changed the ending. Oh. Yeah. Now I understand. I've known him since college, so it's not like he. Uh, stabbed me in the back like he thought he was helping because he thought it was a better ending 
but it's one of those things where the ending kind of is what the story was about to me. So mm-hmm. to change that to me takes away the whole point of the story. So I was like, yeah, if you want me to do anything else, don't do that, please. Right. <laughs> or at least right. ask me beforehand. Right. Like there's, there's a reason behind that, you know, yeah. and wow. Yeah. I think I'd probably rage Slade in the next story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, heard- yeah, he's one of my best friends and I, I know he wasn't trying to like do me wrong. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, yeah, it's uh, the ending <laughs> was the whole point of the story. Right, right. And, and that's so important. I mean, most of the time, um, you know, a, as writers, we know what that ending is. We know what that looks like, you know, and then you get the beginning and then the struggle is, the well, for me, the struggle is like getting the middle, you know, figure yeah. out point A to point C, like what does B look like? Um So we are going to bring up your campaign in a second. We do have some people who are tuning in. Thank you guys for tuning in live. Michaela Jade's been uh, here. I know she gets up god awful early. Sarah Sarah's here. We've got Conry as well, Dragon Multimedia LLC. Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you share this out with your friends. Uh, We've got the brothers Southern Gothic here. And... So the sequel to The Cult Hit the Boger, join Sheriff Hank Tate as he searches for the killer, Mr. Crow. Um, so before before we kind of, I, I, I'll scroll through here because you've got some really good images in, of, of your interiors and things like that. Um, kind of go back and tell us a little bit about that, the, the history where this, where this came from. Did you, was it one particular character that you're developing into this kind of series because this is book two then yeah so i'm i'm going to assume that you've got more coming after yes. this yeah what um, what is your central character what's the the kind of the common thread that's going to carry us through well um each installment's a standalone story oh nice okay yeah but uh, the only uh prevailing thread throughout the whole series is the boger himself He's essentially this uh, immortal being, kind of like a, a, uh, sorry, my dog's on in my lap. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's uh, uh, kind of called the father of vengeance or uh, by some people in the story. Yes. Thanks, champ. Thank you. Um, (laughs) He wants to be, yeah, he wants to be on, on camera too. We love Um, this too. That's okay. Yeah. Or the God of vengeance by some people. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, he's one of those beings that, like, you want revenge against someone, you summon him, and then he takes you know care of whatever you want. So each uh, story, um, you know, deals with uh, revenge of some sort or someone doing something bad that you think they should pay for. And there's uh, later on this whole like overarching thing with like other monsters and um, and so forth. Uh, uh, the first. Uh, graphic novel was basically him fighting organized crime. I wrote it when I was in in high school, so it's kind of bare bones. <laughs> uh, I didn't release it until 2009, but in um, yeah, the second story is basically a murder mystery. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want me t- to discuss the story itself? Oh, I would love for, oh, okay. yeah, so people have a, a, an idea of what this is, uh, and I love the fact that they are standalones. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. when I created it, it was like pre-internet, you know, it was 2009. Mm-hmm. Well, I created it back in 2003 when I was in high school. I didn't, you know, I just kind of, you know, wrote the first one over that uh, span of time. And that was in the days when indie stuff was very hard to find. Right. Uh, so I thought it would, you know, wouldn't it be cool to kind of take, you know, uh, the uh, concept of like, you know, Sandman and stuff like that, where, you had the basic centric character, but, but each story was standalone, you know, obviously Sandman, you know, there's, you know, stuff that happens that uh, throughout the series that transfers over, but, but, you know, if it was, if we'll get to the point where I do enough of them and it was just hard for people to, to, uh, to find them, you know, at that time, like I said, it was before the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, then you know they wouldn't feel like they were missing out if they bought like one 
volume or one book from it. Right. Uh, uh, that's why, like, a lot of my uh, uh, stuff that I'm working on now, after Southern Gothic, is just, like, short stories until I do the next, like, long-form one. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but a Southern Gothic centers primarily around Sheriff Hank Tate. Um, he is, um, as a kid, he saw a man being lynched. So it, it, uh, traumatized him, it haunts him. So to kind of make up for it or, or to kind of, you know, his own way of, of dealing with it, he becomes the town sheriff, uh, uh the town sheriff of his hometown. Mm-hmm. Now he's the town sheriff, you know, dealing with typical small town, uh, stuff. And then, uh, there's killings going around town of entire where someone's killing entire families and he calls himself Mr. Crow uh, because and he's a, a religious fanatic. Like mm-hmm. he's um, he thinks he's taken out uh, like sin and filth and all this stuff. Uh, uh, that's not really a uh, statement on religion. I just thought that was a cool thing for a villain. I mean, not cool, oh, yeah. but an interesting take on a villain. You know, because in reality, those kind of people are just do horrible stuff. Sure. And of course, if I'm going to justify, you know, a monster killing people, then that's probably the uh, route to go. And then all of a sudden, there's this um, separate series of killings that happens where prominent citizens or or former prominent citizens, some of them around town, start dying. And there's these stories of this red-eyed monster appearing around town. So he's trying to find the killers in both situations. And as he's investigating both cases, he learns that they're uh, not only connected to each other, they're connected to that incident that he saw in the past. You know, so he finally in his own mind gets to have some kind of closure with, you know, you know, as a child seeing the worst thing that could happen to a person. Have, um, have any of your characters, when you were develop, developing them, have they they ever kind of frightened you or maybe surprised you and went, wow, that went darker than I expected? Uh, no, my my imagination's pretty dark already that I don't think there's anything that can really uh, <laughs> surprise me uh, mm-hmm. in that aspect. Uh, no, nah, I mean, I usually... Um, yeah, all my writing's pretty dark anyway. So, yeah, I'm not really, I'm not really scared by my own stuff. I guess because I know what's going to happen, mm-hmm. or I know what happens, and I know how other characters are going to ju- uh, deal with it. So, yeah, that's probably the best answer I can come up with. So, when it comes to things like that, then um, you know, you, you know, because you said that uh, you know what's happening. Have you ever maybe tried to push yourself and go, huh, I wonder if I could make this even darker? Like, how twisted can this go? I I usually don't try to um, do shock for shock value. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I don't do stories dark just to make them dark. I do them dark because that's kind of the, the uh, types of stories I've always liked i guess i'm a messed up person i don't know (laughs) but yeah i mean you know i've always loved horror movies i've always loved uh you know like suspense stuff i love ghost stories you know Mm -hmm. they're all dark i don't know what it is about about them that draws me to them Mm -hmm. uh like i said i must be messed up but (laughs) yeah but like everything that happened yeah (laughs) Yeah, but like everything that happens either has something to do with the story or a character. Mm-hmm. And I never try to um, do shock or dark for shock or dark value's sake. Now, the first Boger story, I did a few things like that. And when I was redoing it, I took them out, <laughs> you know, because I just because I just thought they were, you know, it was me being an an edgy teenager thinking, or it was me as a teenager thinking I was being edgy. Uh, and I, was, I was just being, you know, pretentious uh-huh. and, and <laughs> yeah, and whatever you call it. 
And we are, uh, for anybody who's tuning in, we are uh, scrolling through the images here. And I love that uh, that you said it's not just for shock value because uh, I can't even tell you how many times, you know, you see these terrible things on the news, documentaries yeah. and things like that, you know, and uh, there there is truth behind like um, that truth is stranger than fiction sometimes, yeah. you know, and it's just sometimes grabbing onto a story and, uh, and making it, making it your own, you know, putting yeah. your words to it and putting, uh, putting the different emotions and stuff to it. Um, so when it comes to this series then, because now you, you told us that you're kind of work, uh, the Boger is kind of your main book and your main yeah. series, and then you're working on your collection and things like that. Do you, do you think like really far in advance, like uh, where am I going to go with this? How many books are going to be in this before I put it to rest? Or is it something that you think you're going to be working on for the foreseeable future? Uh, I always have multiple ideas in advance. So mm -hmm. as far as I know, yeah, I'm probably going to work on this as on, on uh, both the Boger and flesh and blood just for as long as, Cause I can, cause I have so many ideas that I, you know, I don't, you know, um, I get, uh, I get a few ideas strapped down, then more ideas come, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's just, yeah, that's just the way it is. Uh, uh, being creative is if you have ideas and you don't use them, then it's kind of like, you know, um, uh, they have to get out somehow. Mm-hmm. You know, and the only way to get them out is to do them, you know, is to put them out there. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I have so many Boger stories lined up. I have so many, uh, flesh and blood stories lined up. I have a few, uh, other like long running comics. I have ideas for that. For some reason I can't recall. <laughs> it's probably too late for me to think hard about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sarah, Sarah asks a good question here. Are there any searches on your devices that would make an eyebrow rise if authorities were to browse your history? <laughs> um, no. Uh, I'm going to oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I say, it, I, I'm pretty sure on, I, I'm on a soft watch list because I tell my microphone every once in a while, I'm writing fiction. I'm just doing research. Yeah, and I'm always like, mind your fucking business, Steve. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't think that that they would like raise an eyebrow. Um, you know, maybe they will think I'm messed up, but uh -huh. but no, I don't. Um, now, you know, to be honest, you know, you know, some of my rantings and ravings in other areas they might, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but as far as like you know stuff, you know, hidden stuff on my computer, I'm yeah, I'm I'm fine. They might, or they might, you know, look into some kind of. Uh, you know, some kind of therapy for me or something, but no, no, I mean, you know, yeah, I, I might be, about... I might be slightly offended if I wasn't on some kind of a watch list. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, <laughs> a couple of weeks, I've yeah, like totally I said, offended I'm... and concerned for what they consider flags. Right? Oh yeah. Oh, don't get me started on that, <laughs> on that rabbit hole. Uh, like no... I said, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, you know, they probably raise an eyebrow for other things not right. related to, <laughs> My comic book stuff. So as long as nobody's <laughs> missing in town, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, funny story about that. Oh my God. Back in um, uh, 2016, I've always said that, um, you know, just joking, just joking with friends that if they ever find, um, hear stories about a psychotic, crazy clown running around town, that it would be me. Not too long after I made that joke, the oh, 2016 no. clown sighting no. oh. started. Oh, no. Oh, beautiful, my, beautiful. In my hometown of Greenville, South Carolina. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's. Boo. I had a lot of people texting and calling. was like, are you sure that's not you? I'm sure it's you. I'm like, no, I don't oh. know. I don't go around kids and act like that. No. Oh, my God. That was a joke. That was a joke. I wasn't serious about it. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah, so, so I never make me. jokes like that again. <laughs> 
Yeah, because you never know. Truth is stranger than fiction. I'm telling you. Yeah, um, it's like I could understand if it was like in Atlanta or, or right? like New York or something. No, it started in where I live, where I was born, Greenville, South Carolina. Wow. I had people from all over that know me. So you're the one going around scaring kids, right? You know, I'm like, no, no, God, no, it was no. me. Oh my God, this is South Carolina. You don't do that. You get <laughs> shot, <laughs> right? It's, a, it's the same in Florida. I'm sure it's the same in Louisiana too, right, Nita? <laughs> uh, tell me about the boger, though. Is this, um, is it uh, like a real monster? Is it a phantom is is the boger going to show up in different areas or do you kind well, of keep it in the south uh he shows up in different areas uh mm -hmm. the first uh, uh graphic novel was just a generic city um i didn't really base it on anything the the uh, second uh, one is obviously in the south um I, uh the short story i did in between those two that will be in i guess the third book that i release. Mm -hmm. Uh, took place in Europe during World War II. Uh, the uh, uh, the next actual story I'm doing after Southern Gothic takes place in feudal Japan. He's all over, you know. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, any place anyone w wants to summon him, you know, he pops up. Uh, 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 just because that, you know, um, from a creative standpoint, I like I like escapism a lot, and mm -hmm. you know, in having stories set in different time periods and different places. I have just as much fun as the reader would. Uh, but yeah, he is, he's flesh and blood once he's, <clears throat> excuse me, once he's summoned, but, but when he's not, he's kind of in this like limbo area. Um, I'm big into the paranormal. Mm -hmm. So when I created the Boger, I kind of, you know, based on my aunt, you based his um the way he is on like my own beliefs when you're regarding it like he you know he ex um, exists in the real world in, <clears throat> when he's summoned so he has to like eat and sleep you know just like a a uh, living entity but he's immortal so you can't kill him you know because right. he's essentially a god in in flesh form but then when he's not um not summoned and he's kind of in i guess the spirit world he's essentially a spirit and i've mm -hmm. uh stories playing in the future where he can actually influence or or uh, talk to people in the real world using yeah it's the uh, whole like phantasmal um if i can come up with the right word i get tongue tied a lot if you haven't noticed <laughs> You're doing great. Well, you know, I think that's kind of brilliant for storytelling because you're not limiting yourself to any one location or even time period. So as a creative writer, for me, that that's very appealing because there are a lot of times where I might get lost in research and things like that yeah. when it comes to storytelling or if I'm writing a, a, a longer story. Um, but this kind of gives you that creative license to time jump. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I love history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever I come up with um, a different Boger story, I always try to look at like what time period, what place or country or continent I can um, set it in, you know, just because I, uh, like I said, I love history. So, you know, if I can tell a story you know using that then i'll you know i'll jump on it because uh because i love listening uh, to stories just as much as i love writing them and you know so yeah so i always love hearing about historical events and and uh you know like famous people you know like what they did uh, uh like i don't know if you know about alan uh, Shepard, the uh, first American in space, he wet his pants before he went up. So the first American in space had pee on him. <laughs> uh, I love that story. Yeah. I mean, because yeah, Google it's just... that if you don't know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, better pee than brown spot in your soul. That's yeah. all I have to say. Yeah. And maybe there was that too, but we haven't heard that story yet. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, like I love hearing, you know, about that stuff. And, 
Yeah. <laughs> of course, knowing a lot about history, when you watch the news, you're like, this has been done before. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it also makes you, you know, enjoy life. It also makes you scared of it when you see it happening again. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, this yeah. isn't time or place for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are... Uh, speaking with mitch rogers he's got a campaign right now on indiegogo the boger southern gothic we are at the end of our hour you've got 45 days left flexible goal um hopefully this helps you move the needle a little bit uh by getting to know you and your story and uh more about the boger and what's to come which i think is really interesting i love the fact that uh that there is that creative license to to kind of hop around um the different time periods and things like that that makes it interesting and it allows you to kind of hit on those those areas of interest you know like you were saying world war ii there's so much yeah. history and uh and um i guess nowadays even folklore because uh, a lot of those um uh, many of the veterans from that era are gone now yeah you know and so we are the, kind of the storytellers behind that um, you know, and wherever else you take the boger is going to be really yeah. cool. So uh, one final question before we get going. Um, if you were going to give a brand new creator, whether it's uh, for writing, art, or comic books, uh, if you were going to give them one piece of advice, what would that be? Do it. Do it. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, here uh, at, at cons, I you know, always hear advice. Or I always uh, hear people asking for advice, mm-hmm. and you know, there's there's a thousand reasons not to do it. There's only one reason to do it, and that's more important than the thousand reasons not to. Uh, I was I had parents that don't, you know always told me if you don't try, you know, you may fail, but if you mm-hmm. don't try, you'll never know. Yeah, failing's easy. Yeah, <laughs> failing is very easy. But uh, trying it and doing it, that that yeah. is a cut above a lot of other people. Yeah. yeah, especially nowadays with the internet, you know, there's no reason to not do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you know, like I said, you may fail, but, you know, you won't know it, mm-hmm. unless you try. Yeah. And on that note, you guys, uh, we have been raging with... Mitch Rogers, the Boger Southern Gothic is on Indiegogo right now. Make sure that you head over there and give it some love. If you've already backed it, thank you. If not, share it out with your friends. Uh, support it if you can. We appreciate you. Mitch, it's been a pleasure. Hey, Nita. Yo. Final words. Throw my dudes. We're out of here, you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Hit the subscribe Thanks button. Thanks for having me. Hit the button, you guys. Yes. Hit it. Do it now. Do it. Bye. Hey there, this is Meredith Lochran with Ragin, and I wanted to let you know that we encourage and promote independent creators and their projects through organic interaction, consultations, and more. Visit Nita and me at RaginABC.com for details and contact information. Hit the button.